What might people who love God and others before themselves look like? Because we're not talking about specific laws anymore, the possibilities for expressing this are limitless. The New Testament, however, is full of examples. If we love God, it means we trust him with our lives. It means we try to get to know him better. It means we show our gratitude towards him, worship him and praise him. It means we joyfully serve him, pray to him, live in accordance with his will, walk by his leading, hold fast to the truth about him and defend it where necessary, tell others about what Jesus has done, do everything in life for his glory and be diligent in our devotion and study of his word. It means we don't have idols, we don't let anything replace him in our affections. We don't give position to false teachers who skew the word of God and we don't mock, disobey, blaspheme or speak against him. If we love others that means that we love not just those who love us but our enemies too. It means showing compassion and sympathy and even sharing in the suffering of others. It means being forgiving and forbearing. It means dealing honestly and fairly with everyone and never cheating anyone. It means doing good to all and helping everyone wherever we can. It means telling the truth. It means being courteous and trying to live at peace with everyone. It means treating others like we would want them to treat us. It means providing a good example and means urging one another to do good deeds and to help those who are falling away from the faith. It also means never lying, never stealing, never committing murder, committing adultery or fornication, never speaking evil of others or being what the Bible calls unequally yoked in marriage. It means working out disputes with each other in private and staying debt free. You know what? It looks like even smaller things like these. It looks like holding the doors open for one another, saying please and thank you, being courteous, polite, sending flowers, making the world a little brighter for everyone you meet. It looks like simple good manners. The beauty of this new law is that you are not restricted by a specific set of 613 rules on how you love God and others. Instead, you are free to express your love spontaneously, authentically and extravagantly in any way you can imagine. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. In other words, let's see how inventive and imaginative we can be in loving one another. It's an exciting thing to adopt this mentality. Some translations use the phrase outbursts of love and good works. Love should be bursting out of us so that we are lavish and liberal with it. We can never go too far in loving God or others. The Bible takes the time to describe what this love looks like in our personal relationships. It says that when you love others, you naturally put their needs ahead of your own. Love is selfless, not selfish. Therefore, it calls us to submit to one another. It tells us wives should lovingly submit to their husbands and that husbands should lovingly put his wife's needs ahead of his own to the extent that he would give up his own life for her. A lot is made of wives being taught to submit to their husbands in Christian teaching, but the second part is equally important. Husbands are to be servant leaders by putting her needs first. In the same way, the Bible tells children to be obedient to parents and parents not to be harsh with their children, but to do what's best for them. Again, put each other first out of love. This also means that employees serve their bosses sincerely with their hardest work and it means that the employer treats the employee as best as they can looking after their needs. Love for one another introduces us to the principle of mutual submission which means that those under authority submit to that authority and those in authority use it to serve rather than to rule. Jesus was the first example of servant leadership. It was a revolutionary concept. Remember when Jesus knelt down to wash his disciples feet. The Bible says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. God will bless you for it. So even though Jesus was their Lord and had authority over them, he used his position to serve. Likewise, husbands, though they have authority over their wives, serve their wives. Parents, though they have authority over children, serve them. Bosses, though they have authority over employees, serve them. In other words, do what is best for them. In exchange, the wives, children and employees submit willingly and lovingly to godly leadership. This is how we create harmonious homes, workplaces and societies. This servant leadership concept is also the origin of the idea that our politicians and public officials are elected to serve us rather than to rule over us. In fact, we call our elected officials public servants. We elect them so that they can serve us and in return, we willingly submit to their leadership. 
This is another concept we owe to Jesus and of course, as God is marginalised from society, this is another thing which is being lost. Government leaders are increasingly power grabbing, dictatorial and acting out of self-interest, not for the good of the people. This is evidenced by multiple corruption scandals. But when we put this concept of Christ-like mutual submission into practice out of love for one another, it is the most beautiful thing imaginable. It causes peace and harmony, and the more good you do for others, the more good they will do for you. In this way, love multiplies.